Welcome to the Potter Blog site. It's Friday, September 16th, approximately 6 p.m. I have a uh, troubling alert to give out this evening. It's in reference to our uh, radioactive rainfall we had on September the 13th, which was uh, initially had, about, had a reading of 133 times greater than background. Uh, the radioactivity in that sample has not died out completely, therefore indicating a longer half-life fallout in it. And it's the first time I've been able to detect such a longer half-life fallout. I've done some math on the longer half-life part, and the average half-life I'm getting for this fallout is 2.4 days. Now, the conjecture I'm going to put forth, actually this is stronger than a conjecture, is a, uh, the theory I'm putting forth is, is that what I've detected is a Neptunium-239. Now that's extremely troubling, and let me show you why. This is Neptunium-239. It decays into Plutonium-239. Neptunium-239 has a half-life of 2.4 days on average. The source of Neptunium-239 is americium-243. Americium-243 is a relatively stable 7,388 year half-life. This is the stuff you'll find in smoke detectors. I don't think anybody's dropped a smoke detector on my house. I believe the source here for americium-243 uh, can be tied directly to Fukushima unit number three, MOX fuel plant. The, uh, as the reactor undergoes a fuel burnout, a, a MOX fuel burnout, it will convert uh, plutonium-242 uh, into americium-243. And the americium-243 decays into neptunium-239, which decays into plutonium-239. So that's my theory, that the 2.4 day half-life material I've detected in the rainfall here in St. Louis is neptunium-239. I hope I'm wrong, and I wish somebody out there was uh, publicly publishing data that would allay these concerns. But uh, since that's non-existent, uh, the best we have is some hidden data from the EPA, which we know that they uh, censor. Here's the uh, beta charts for this week, down here on this end. And they heavily censor the beta charts. Here are the gamma charts, and you can see significant gamma spikes during this time frame. But more importantly, let's go to my data, which I've quickly worked up to try to get this alert out. What I've done here is, this is after all the shorter half-life stuff has, uh, has left. And so what I've done here is I've taken samples. These are the times I took the samples. Uh, this sample was taken the next day, which is why I had to add 12 hours in. These samples are one hour total counts. So what I would do is I'd take a one hour total count of the sample, the radioactive fallout sample. That sample was in that plastic bag, so I'm only detecting beta and gamma radiation. Then afterwards, I would take another one hour reading um, in the same location, just of the background, and get how many counts I got out of that. And I did that several times. Uh, this time, I actually missed the uh, background reading because I was doing another reading. So I estimated this background reading. And then we have the one I did today. So what I've done here is I've subtracted the uh, background reading, the background reading from the sample. So this is the total counts per hour above background. And what I've done then is this sample, you can see there's a jump here and then it levels out. And I believe the reason for this jump here is because we're still tracking 
some of the uh, shorter half-life radiation. And here we've transitioned into nothing but the longer half-life radiation. So to try to determine what this is with these one-hour samples, what I've done is uh, graphed them and then did a uh, exponential fit to the curve and calculated the half-life. Now the first one I did here was from uh, 434 counts per hour above background, uh, 353 counts per hour above background, 16 hour difference. And basically what I did there was uh, I skipped this one because I had to estimate the background. And what I came out with was a 53 hour half-life. The next one I did is I included the one where I had to skip the half-life. I, I skipped the background and I used the estimated background of the previous sample, 2,055 counts. And when I did that, I got this curve. And as you can see, the fit's not quite as well, but it comes up with a 63-hour half-life. And finally, what I did was is I averaged these out to get the uh, 2.4 day half-life and unfortunately that matches Neptunium 239 we have we're on the same latitude as Fukushima we've got a jet stream carrying this stuff over here they've got a MOX fuel plant that as it burns out is fully capable of producing 239 and we've got evidence of uh, nuclear fuel on the ground producing large radon releases so what I've held all along is that the short half-life radiation is proportional to the amount of harder to detect half-life radiation in the fallout we get in St. Louis. But this is the first time, this is the second time I've ever had such high levels of uh, radioactivity above 100 times background. This is the first time, to my knowledge, where I've ever been able to detect that the background, I mean that the radiation sample did not always, re did not return to zero. So that's where we are two and a half day half-life which has a I think in my opinion a high probability of being Neptunium 239 so I would advise taking appropriate uh, precautions in knowing that this will become changing into a plutonium uh, 239 and whatever you do stay out of the rain good night